brief introduction to spatial heterogeneity here. As we look on our <clears throat> California coastal headlands here, you see what um, is a good amount of spatial heterogeneity. We see um, the coastal hills coming up, we see roads, we see um, relatively denuded areas, relatively short statured vegetated areas, relatively woody high stature vegetation covering other swaths. We see areas that look like they are <clears throat> um, highly productive with a lot of green tissues, areas that are senescing or that have a lot of browning uh, or dying back tissues. We see the ocean interfacing with the land. We see sandy beaches. We see large grained um, stretches of landscape and so on and so forth. So this what I think would qualify as a heterogeneous landscape. And it turns out heterogeneity is a key aspect of both our natural world, but also our approaches to conserve diversity. And so heterogeneity is fundamentally important to many, many aspects of nature and many aspects of our response to the crisis that we're dealing with now across our planet. When we talk about spatial heterogeneity, we can talk about a variety of types of heterogeneity, but most of the time we're talking about landscape heterogeneity. And in particular, mostly talking about landscape spatial heterogeneity more often than not. We can call this landscape spatial heterogeneity, or we can call it habitat patchiness. We can call this spatial complexity, a whole host of terms that all refer to the same uh, thing, which we're talking about the physical variation in structure as we move uh, uh, throughout space. Spatial heterogeneity, generally speaking, refers to how clumpy or how patchy given elements of the landscape are, how, cl how clumpy the trees are, how um, patchy the cliffs are, um, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Generally speaking, while there's a huge array of the types of heterogeneity we can talk about, Generally speaking, we're talking about spatial heterogeneity. We can most commonly break this down into four primary uh, things that draw our attention and that are a focus of management interventions. The first is topographical diversity or topographical features. Next, the idea of gradients across our environment, the effect of disturbance events, and then um, how we can generate spatial pattern formation from biological interactions. With the topographical features, the, the example of, of where and how we get um, heterogeneity in space um, from topography is, uh, is, is pretty straightforward. This is probably pretty obvious to just about everybody. Um, we start with, we always start with the abiotic environment, the abiotic conditions, the non-living conditions. That defines where critters can possibly live. So if we're talking about inside a volcano um, or or uh, deep under the earth, many critters just simply can't live there. So um, we first say, hey, what, are, what is the physical constraint? What is the abiotic constraint of this landscape? And once we pass through that lens, then we can talk about others. So we can see that, for example, here on the bottom. On the left is a topographic, a relief map of the state of California, right? So the browner the coloration, the higher the uh, surface of the ground is relative to sea level. And so we have some areas that are very high, some areas that are very low, and areas that are uh, patchy. Overlaying onto that existing abiotic template is another type of template. And so this would be the matrices, the soils, which is, yes, our, our uh, horticulture friends will tell us that the soil is living, and it is, but uh, by and large, a lot of this are, is, is the result of sedimentation and deposition from uh, geological action, etc. So overlaying on top of this topographic variation, we have this different soil uh, geological underlayment and, um, and an additional layer of heterogeneity. Then on top of that, both those things come together to produce both the, the pattern of precipitation along with our, our atmosphere, but also how well um, these soils retain water, for example. And so when we add all that together, we tend to get even more um, uh, variation in terms of the water holding capacity and the routine 
um, amount of water that is contained in the soils. And that will in turn have a strong influence on the type of vegetation that can grow there. Another example, environmental gradients. So all critters have an optimal uh, a, a set of environmental conditions where they thrive. Uh, and so that's being symbolized here by this uh, normal distribution where we're going from some low level of some particular environmental variant. You can call it water, you can call it warmth, heat, um, whatever you want to pick. So we go from a low level on the left to a high level on the right. And clearly at some point, the, the stuff, let's take water, is so low, there's absolutely no water, the organisms can't live there. Similarly, we have a massive amount of water. If it's a terrestrial organism, they can't be submerged for 365 days out of the year. And so that's bad. In the middle is the optimal condition for that particular species. Now that's great. As we move off that peak, we get into areas where, yeah, the critter can live, but maybe not as ideally, but it can live. And then as we go farther away, we're like, well, he can survive and so on and so forth. So all critters have a whole variety, uh, you know, a, a wide number of dimensions um, of these environmental gradients. And so these gradients are being set up all the time, for example, from the sunlight, um, uh, which is influenced by the aspect of the, the mountain or the hillside. So we have different amounts of light, different amounts of warmth. We can also talk about uh, how stable the soils are. So, for example, in this case, this, this beach system, we see that we have some areas that are very um, uh, steep sloped and maybe erosive, other areas that are flatter, less erosive, more stable, etc. And then we have something, uh, and we can see the effect of, of when we really deviate strongly from these gradients or when we have a, a strong change in the gradients is something like an oasis, um, as we see here, where we have, we're surrounded by arid landscapes but one of the environmental gradients, in this case availability of water, is such that it's readily available and, and in this case vegetation is strongly responding to that. So number two is environmental gradients. They can set up heterogeneity in space. Uh, we can see that in a variety of ways as we just discussed, but also here's a, here's a really nice example from closer to home. This is the Carpinteria Salt Marsh in extreme southern Santa Barbara County. And what we're looking at are all these really cool uh, tidal channels. And so the fresh water is coming in from the land sources, primarily around here and over here, coming in. The ocean water is coming into the estuary from this mouth right here. And so this is very salty. This is very fresh. And in here, there is a mixing. And so depending on tides, depending on time of year, depending on rains, that, 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 that mixing zone is going to be closer to the mouth or closer to the back. And so critters have to respond to that environmental gradient. Um, in some cases, respond to it seasonally. In other cases, respond to it over the course of a tidal cycle. So uh, some critters are just very tolerant. Others have a behavioral response. So, so the crabs, let's say, will actually move up, actively move up and down in the tidal channel to maintain a particular salinity that they prefer. We can also talk about how disturbance can create heterogeneity. And so this is perhaps more familiar to us in the form of wildfires or floods or hurricanes, disease outbreaks, etc. All of these disturbance events tend to act to break up homogeneity, tend to act to break up um, a relatively monotone or consistent environment with uh, increased patchiness, increased turnover. So we see that on the left with wildfire that's burned this patch of forest up in Washington. We can see that in the middle panel, in this case caused by disease induced by climate change. So we're looking at pine beetle infestations in Wyoming. So what's going on here is because of climate change, um, we've induced uh, more drought, so the trees are more stressed. The naturally occurring bark beetles, beetles that attack these woody species, these trees, um, and burrow into their um, uh, cambium and burrow into their um, outer bark, um, the typical response is the tree floods that, that area with sap to try to smother the beetle. When they have a lot of water, lots of juices flowing inside of those trees, it's relatively easy to do. But when we have a drought condition, which is more and more the norm for us in the western U.S., it's harder to do. Add to that with climate change, we have changed the warmth, we've changed the, the average temperature. In particular, we've reduced 
the duration and frequency of cold snaps in the winter. So we've actually made the winters warmer. And what that's done is that's taken an insect that typically completes one life cycle over a typical year. And now because they're not constrained by the freezing colds of cold winter anymore, they're actually completing two or sometimes three life cycles in a given year. And as a consequence, they're exploding and killing all kinds of trees. And so we have large swaths of the Western US that now have massive numbers of dead bark beetle killed trees. And that's in effect creating more heterogeneity, creating more patchiness in our forest systems. On the right, we have lava in Hawaii. And so this is, uh, you know, classic, uh, classic disturbance in that the lava comes in and burns up all, essentially all the macroscopic life. And then when the lava cools, we have this patch of de novo uh, rock island that uh, has nothing macroscopic living on it. So a clear example of heterogeneity induced from natural disturbances. This is one of my favorite examples. This is an example from uh, the Willamette Forest up in Oregon. And if you and I walk through a forest, we would see typically regular forests, right? And, and we would say, oh, it's a forest, and it looks more or less like a forest to us. But other organisms perceive heterogeneity differently. And so you and I are moving through trees, and a tree seems to be a tree, seems to be a tree. But if we were a critter that fed on these trees, say a beetle, um, they might look very different. And so when a fire comes through, such as on the left, and burns up, especially the smaller trees and the, uh, the, the understory vegetation, um, we, it tends to have an effect, a very patchy effect, on the um, tree composition. So again, this is not a massive raging crown fire that's gonna kill all the trees. This is a more quote unquote typical, more natural, more routine type of fire that we've historically seen in these forests. And so while the forest uh, looks like in the center picture, you, when you and I walk through it now, it looks, ah, oh, it's a forest. But if we're a beetle or an organism sensitive to the particular age of these trees, it could look very different. And that's what we're seeing here on the right. So researchers in the late 80s mapped this in a very detailed fashion. So it's a great example of this. And so what we're looking down is we're looking at, we're looking at a, 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 down at a map of a patch of forest. And we have these different patches of different ages. So the, eight, the areas that have high mortality have very few um, uh, large trees remaining. The ones that have very low mortality have a lot of high, large diameter, big, thick, old trees. And so this is actually at the scale of kilometers. This is what the, the heterogeneity looks like in this particular forest. So really a product of the historic forest fires that naturally occurred here um, well over 100 years ago. And then we can get uh, spatial heterogeneity um, that's a response to, um, that's, that's a consequence of biological interactions. And I can't get that guy to play. Sorry, I don't know why that guy's not playing. Um, but uh, this is um, created from um, behaviors, right, in, in, in various uh, different ecological settings. So on the lower left over here, we have some seabirds. These seabirds that um, don't, can't just nest anywhere. They want to nest on these offshore islands. Um, and so they, they, they want to be out there, but they don't want to be right next to another nesting uh, population, another nesting pair, because uh, they might get into a fight and get problems and stuff. So, so there's an optimal spacing distance here, since everybody wants to be there, but they don't want to be right next to each other. So this very regular spacing of seabird nests is a consequence of that biology. Uh, similarly, we can see how um, dune vegetation is influenced um, by the moving sands. And so um, we have some areas where the vegetation has um, established itself and is uh, allowing um, the stabilization of the dune right around those plants. But in other areas, the sand is very much so moving and it's hard for plants to get established there. On the far right, we see some little gobies that are tending their soft bottom sediments and they are uh, creating little nesting areas. And so they also create these very surprisingly regular honeycomb-like patterns in the bottom of the ocean. On the upper left, you see an example of, um, we have a swell and shrink soils. So these would be clay-rich soils that when we have a lot of water, they, they're really great at retaining water, making little mini wetlands and things of that nature. But when they dry out, eventually they, they fracture. In those little cracks, those are other places where before we have a lot of water, we just have a little bit of water, uh, an occasional light rain or morning dew that will concentrate in those little cracks 
and actually be both wetter, have a higher humidity, all kinds of great stuff that can induce plants to germinate. So what we're seeing here is all these great wildflower flowers germinating in the cracks of those soils. On the right is another, if you, if you could have seen it, um, it's not, not animated properly, but if you could have seen it, that's actually a fish, another fish on the bottom of the ocean who's going around in, in, in prepping its nest, but as a consequence, he keeps going around, going around, makes this apparently very regular pattern on the sediment on the bottom of the ocean. So all kinds of great ways to get spatial heterogeneity um, and, and very, very important to the explaining the patterns in diversity and, and how we will go forward in, in protecting these things. We can talk about um, these things. Uh, what are, um, is this heterogeneous or homogeneous? The reality is these are always a contiguous um, thing. So there's always a range. So on the left, this uh, forest looks very heterogeneous. We have some areas with no trees, some areas with a lot of trees. This coral reef in the middle also looks highly heterogeneous. All kinds of wonderful coral heads, uh, uh, highly varied microtopography, et cetera. Our sandy beach appears generally not so heterogeneous, more homogeneous, relatively the same, relatively flat. Uh, topographically, uh, not a whole lot of uh, clear spatial structure in this system. Uh, something like Joshua Tree, again, looks you know very, fairly heterogeneous to us. We have rocky outcrops, we have some vegetation, we have um, uh, yucca brevifolia. Um, grassland, another one that might appear at first glance to be eh, relatively homogeneous. Um, there's actually, I can see some structure in there, but still compared to, say, a tropical rainforest or somewhat something else, not as much uh, heterogeneity. The surface of the ocean, again, to most folks would appear to be very homogeneous. Indeed, there's a lot of structure there, but, but spatially looks fairly homogeneous. And then something perhaps more familiar in our California coastal zone, something like this uh, oak woodland grassland interface where we have some mountains in the background, some large oak trees in the foreground, and a lot of um, grasses and forbs and herbaceous plants all around in the foreground. So again, um, all of these things, depending on the scale and the metric, could be considered heterogeneous or homogeneous, but um, the reality is you should conce conceptualize heterogeneity and homogeneity as a spectrum. So we're closer to one side or closer to the other, but we're never absolutely purely homogeneous, and we're never absolutely purely heterogeneous, and it's going to depend on our, our lens that we bring to framing of the problem. But, uh, but spatial heterogeneity is a key thing. Importantly, this differs from how, um, so natural heterogeneity differs from the type of heterogeneity that you and I tend to generate. In nature, natural or mature patches usually are dominated by rich internal patch structure. And that's um, in comparison to the types of frag uh, the, the types of patches that we humans tend to create we make relatively simple uh, uh, patches with relatively simple internal um, structure and so an example here would be something like these forest patches which were uh, which are very heterogeneous in terms of um, topography in terms of microbial communities in terms of all kinds of stuff but when we fragment that carve it up, turn that into ag land, it becomes much less. So the ag land is now much less structured and much less heterogeneous than the natural system. Also, as we go from, um, from natural patches to patches, we tend to have fewer um, strong edge effects. Whereas if we go from a natural landscape to a human dominated landscape, we tend to have very strong edge effects. So in this case, in a more natural setting, we tend to go, oh, there's some tall vegetation, and then there's some a little bit, a little bit lower vegetation, there's a little bit lower vegetation, and then we finally get to the low vegetation. Um, uh, that's different than the human situation oftentimes. As we fragment stuff, we also generate evolutionarily unique threats. So a roadway is not the kind of thing that uh, turkeys have evolved with. So a Maserati going 100 miles an hour is not uh, something that these organisms have had to respond to in their evolutionary history. So it's a very high bar. It's a very difficult lift to expect these critters to adapt quickly to these human-induced um, uh, changes from the type of spatial heterogeneity we introduce or the type of spatial variation we create. So just to summarize, 
Spatial heterogeneity is really key. It's a, it's a wonderful aspect of our planet. It's a part that I love about our planet, one of the many parts. Um, and it's also something we need to understand in a conservation context. When we understand this, we can also deploy spatial heterogeneity uh, in response to some of the threats that we've seen. And the most, the classic cases of, of spatial heterogeneity are topographical heterogeneity, heterogeneity from environmental gradients, inherent environmental gradients, heterogeneity in, from induced disturbances, and um, heterogeneity from biological interactions. All of these are key aspects of heterogeneity. All of them we will be exploring throughout our course. Thanks, everybody. Be well.